if you look at the top picture, you can see that Mexico City is very hazy on a smoggy day. And then with the clear sky that, uh, picture down here, you can see the mountains in the background. And the mountains in the background are the key to why they have such a smog problem. The case study for the chapter um, compares uh, Los Angeles to Mexico City. In the United States, we have the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act helped to uh, reduce the emissions of the six criteria air pollutants that we had done on that chart, which we'll get that chart out in a little bit and fill that in um, because you had a, a part of that that was missing. Um, and the vehicles are the biggest problem. The thing with Mexico uh, in Mexico City, they didn't have a similar or as stringent requ requirements for air quality. They don't have the Clean Air Act like we do. Um, in uh, Los Angeles, a lot of the pollutants have been cut. Mexico City, not so much. Um, so, atmosphere. You have to know that the atmosphere is 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. Um, the rest is minute concentrations. Uh, I know we spent a lot of time talking about carbon dioxide and how important it is for the greenhouse effect and, and global warming and all that. That's fine. But you have to understand that 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen and 21% is oxygen. These things like CFCs and carbon dioxide, super minute concentrations. Carbon dioxide is 400 parts a million. That's tiny. That's 0.04%. Okay, 78% is nitrogen. Well, nobody talks about nitrogen because you know it's not a big deal. Um, so human activity is changing some of the amounts of gases, like methane, like ozone, like carbon dioxide. And so we're going to be getting into those a little bit today. If we look at this giant chart, again, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and even that makes 99%. Excuse me, that makes 98%. Um, no, that makes 99. Sorry, that 99 percent. The other one percent, most of that other one percent, 0.93 percent of that one percent, right, is argon. So that's 99.3 percent. No, I did that wrong. 99.93 percent. Sorry about my math. Anyway, so you have all these other things uh, like water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane. These pollutants, they're there, but they're not um, in very high numbers. So uh, on your quiz, a lot of you guys missed this. Of all the greenhouse gases, water vapor is the most abundant greenhouse gas. Carbon dioxide is way less abundant. Okay, And the most important greenhouse gas is water vapor. It helps to moderate our climate. It keeps the world nice and, and habitable. Okay, Water vapor is our friend. Greenhouse gases are good. Um, but when we get too many like carbon dioxide, that's a problem. Um, this is very important. Um, here's a here's a person at sea level in the troposphere. Okay, we live in the troposphere. Remember, E T may start telephoning Earth. Got to know those in order. Okay. Um, so if I go up a mountain, look, there's temperature. Temperature is decreasing, and this is altitude. Altitude is increasing. As I go up a mountain, uh, it's going to get colder. That's why you need a coat when you go on top of Mount Everest. That's a thing, right? Okay. Uh, North Face for life. No, just kidding. Everybody can wash those coats. They're not mountain climbing. It's fine. Um, so, anyway, stratosphere. Notice the temperature starts to go up in the stratosphere. The reason, and this is on the test, the reason the temperature goes up in the stratosphere is because um, you have a higher uh, concentration of ozone in the stratosphere. So, that ozone that keeps us safe, we talked about it yesterday, the triplets with the superpower, um, they do that by absorbing ultraviolet radiation. When they absorb ultraviolet radiation, that warms up the stratosphere. So, um, so the stratosphere is warmer with height. And then notice from there, so it decreases, increases, decreases, increases. And the reason it increases in the thermosphere is because you have those gases that interact of uh, solar winds, the nitrogen and oxygen, way up high that make the solar winds. Those are also absorbing some, some of the light from the sun and heating up the thermosphere. So um, there's the layers real quick with the temperature. So if you can remember, as you go up a mountain, it gets colder, stratosphere warmer, colder, warmer. It just alternates. Okay. Um, next. We have, um, here's the troposphere, like I had told you guys, the, tr the troposphere is where we live. It has where we have weather. Um, another thing that is in the troposphere that people just get confused on for whatever reason, the greenhouse gases, GHGs, the greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect happens in the troposphere. The reason the greenhouse effect happens in the troposphere is because all the gases in the atmosphere are in the troposphere mostly. 75% of the atmosphere's mass is in the troposphere. So if gases like water vapor and carbon dioxide warm the earth, if most of the gases are in the troposphere, then that's where the greenhouse effect happens. Um, so 
The stratosphere for the 11th time is what keeps us safe. It contains a ozone layer. Um, it gets warmer with altitude. The reason it gets warmer with altitude is because the ozone absorbs some ultraviolet radiation and that creates heat. Mesosphere, that's where meteors burn up. Temperatures decrease. Thermosphere, temperatures increase again. Um, atmosphere, pressure, relative humidity, all that's nice. I will tell you that microclimates, some examples of microclimates, these are just small regional areas where the climate is a little bit different. So remember we talked about the urban heat island effect? The urban heat island is an example of a microclimate. Also, if you have like a lake, right, that area near the lake might be cooler. Um, or if you have um, a, a hilly area or a mountainous area in your town, that's going to be a little bit cooler. So those are examples of microclimate. Even something as small as a parking lot, not even in a city, that could be a little bit warmer and have a little bit different climate. That's a microclimate. Um, so this just kind of reiterates what I told you guys about uh, the amount of air particles in the atmosphere. As I go up into the atmosphere, you have less atmospheric gases, and so the density of the air is going to be less. Um, temperature um, is going to get uh, cooler, but also atmospheric pressure is going to get lower. That's why they need oxygen masks when they climb up in their coats so on my outer wrist, right? There's less air to breathe. There's less air particles. Um, we had talked about this a lot, in case you missed it. Um, three reasons the equator is hotter than the poles. The first reason is the sun strikes at a more direct angle, 90 degrees, right there. Um, and so you, it strikes a smaller surface area, and so the sunlight is going to be more concentrated at a lower angle here, you know, 15 or 20 degrees. Um, you're going to have it spread over a larger area, so the sunlight is going to be less concentrated. Like I told you about the frosting on a cupcake, thick frosting, thinner frosting. All right. Um, if you notice, the second reason the equator is hotter than poles is the actual amount of the atmosphere that the sun has to travel through at the poles is a longer distance. And so um, that top little line I drew here, um, that light from the sun is going to get scattered uh, more and it's not going to be as concentrated when it reaches the sun's, uh, excuse me, the earth's surface. The last reason the equator is hotter than the poles is because the um, surface, actual, the color of the surface, the white um, snow on top of the poles, uh, on the south pole, whatever, um, those are going to be uh, high in albedo because of ice, so it's going to be really reflective. Albedo is how reflective something is, and so they're going to reflect the sun's light versus the equator, which is covered in uh, less lush vegetation and dark colored ocean water. Um, so, the reason we have seasons because the the tilt of the axis. We did this with basketballs. It was great. Good times. I have a little earth here. And so, on the test, there's this picture, and you have to know uh, which month each picture is. And so, if you look at the axis and you can think about an actual ball, you can tell that right here the sun is pointed more <coughs> toward the southern hemisphere. So this is their winter. This is our. I don't know why I said that. This is the southern hemisphere summer, excuse me. This is our winter because we're tilted away from the sun. So um, this would be an equinox here if I'm here. Um, and then, yeah, you, know, you can see very clearly that we're tilted toward the sun. So this would be our summer. And then another equinox, sorry. Um, so be, be uh, ready to answer these questions about what month of the year it is, okay? Y'all good on that one? Good times. Um, next. Convection, um, this is a question on the test. Convection, is, um, it's fueled by, remember convection is just the flow of materials to redistribute heat, um, but convection on the Earth's surface is fueled by warm, moist air at the surface. Go, it's going to rise, and when it does, it's going to cool, and uh, the water is going to evaporate, and then the air is going to sink back down. So all of those things. <coughs> Here's a convection cell. Um, this would be uh, low pressure. This would be high pressure. And this whole cycle here is a convection cell. 
Um, weather is what is happening at a certain, it's the atmospheric conditions at any one point in time. Uh, climate is the patterns over a larger time. And I like this little quote down here from Mark Twain. Climate is what you expect, weather is what you actually get. And I think that's accurate. So um, really cool, we have a cold front coming in today. Um, thunderstorms tonight, do you know that's a thing? Have you seen the weather? So um, tomorrow's going to be cold like girls. Tomorrow is the day to break out like your boots and your scarf, all that. And then, then it's going to be cold for a while, okay? Um, today is the last, like, oh, it's not that bad. I'm going to wear a t-shirt. No. That's, this, this is it. Um, so let me tell you about a cold front and a warm front real quick. Let me show you this cold front right for, for, first. So what we have been moving today is we have some cold air coming from out west. Um, and so if you look right here, the cold front is this boundary. Um, and... Cold air, when it comes into your area, cold air will not rise. And so cold air moving into your area is going to take the warm air that's in place, like the air outside yesterday it was pretty warm, right? It was all right. Um, and so the warm air that's in place is going to get violently shoved up into the air um, because the cold air cannot rise. And so it comes through like a, like a snow plow and it shoves the warm, up out of the warm air up out of the way. Um, and so when you get that, you get this very heavy precipitation and you start to get this... Um, really uh, quick uh, circulation and convection within the clouds. That's where hell comes from. Tornadoes could spawn from this. Um, and so cold fronts bring violent weather because you have a violent <laughs> movement of air. Uh, warm fronts are kind of chill. And so when I have warm air coming into an area, warm air can just rise over the cold air. No big deal. And so this is where you have drizzle and you want to take it like a nap and nothing interesting is happening and you could, you know, that's a warm front. Um, and so it's because the warm air can rise up over the cold air without any big to do. It doesn't matter. So um, high and low pressure. Remember high pressure is heavier. It sinks. It's more dense. But it's heavier and it sinks. goes clockwise. Um, it spreads out at the ground. Low pressure moves in at the ground, rises up, lousy weather, light air, so it rises. And then ringing some bells right now. Okay, so there's your stuff if you needed that again. Now I need to stop and explain this. So get somewhere on your paper that you can draw a picture. This picture. Okay, um, so here we go. We're going to draw uh, Los Angeles. I'm going to draw some mountains. So Los Angeles is in a valley, right? You ever heard of Valley Girls? Yeah, like Los Angeles is in a valley. That's where that's coming from. Did I just blow your mind a little bit? Have you ever heard of Valley Girls? Okay, well. Um, next, let's draw some um, buildings. It'll be super fun. And then we'll draw some cars. So, I'm not so good at drawing cars. Don't say anything to me about my cars. So, lots of cars. Like millions of cars in Los Angeles. Okay, so um, these people, when they're driving to work at like 7 o'clock in the morning, we're going to draw the sun. Sun rises in the east and sets in the west. That's a thing. Have you heard that before? Am I blowing your mind right now? So I'm going to draw a sun. The sun is at 7 o'clock in the morning, is it going to be reaching the city? They're going to get some sunlight? Why not? Because the mountains. Y'all are, are so smart. Um, I'm going to switch colors for the sun. I think I'm going to make it yellow. I'm going to be, I'm going to live dangerously. So this is 9 a.m. Still getting sun in the city. No, still in the shadow of the mountains, okay? Um, 11 a.m., we're getting some sun. But the air in the city is staying pretty cool the whole morning, right? Because it's, it's in the shadow of the mountains. And so... I like noon and one o'clock in the afternoon. That should be a p.m. There you go. So 
here's the thing. What's going to end up happening by the time the sun is overhead, okay, the whole morning when people are commuting, the city is shaded by the mountains. And so the whole time people are driving to work, the city's air is going to be relatively cool. So you have all this cool air down in the valley, and all these people are going to be driving to work, putting out all kinds of vehicle emissions. And this air's cold. Can the cold air rise? No. Can't do it, can it? So all this, mm -mm, all these emissions from these cars are getting trapped at surface level. And so by the time the sun does come up, you're going to have warm air, but it's going to be up here. And so in between, we have this little inversion layer. If I invert something, if I take a can of hairspray and I invert it a couple times, what does that mean? What does invert mean? Turn upside down. So um, an inversion layer, a thermal inversion layer, that's what we're talking about, a thermal inversion layer, the temperatures are turned upside down because isn't it supposed to be that warm air is at the surface and then as I start climbing my mountain, I gotta put a coat on, right? So the temperatures in these cities that are surrounded by mountains, the temperatures end up being upside down. And that's a problem because you have people that live in these valleys and the whole time they're driving to work, they're putting all these air pollutants out, but those air pollutants are going to get trapped in the ground instead of being able to mix up into the atmosphere. Have you ever looked at Plant Bowen and looked at the smokestack, right? There's the cooling towers that look like an hourglass. That just has water coming out of it. But the really tall, tall smokestacks, they're very tall. Do you know why they're so tall? In case there's an inversion layer, that would be able to go above the inversion layer and mix up into the atmosphere. So that's the reason you have really, really, really tall smokestacks in case you get an inversion layer, which we're around the, we have a lot of vegetation and we have around the, the river and that sometimes will set up an inversion layer because it's going to be cooler. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of fog. The reason we have fog around here is for the same reason. So that's why you have to have tall smokestacks on power plants. Um, so their picture is okay, but I like mine better. So this is normal. Normal, you have warm at the ground and cooler temperatures as you go up, and so then all the pollutants can go into the atmosphere and rise and mix. Um, with the inversion layer, though, here's their picture. Um, here's their mountains. See them? And, and so you're going to have warm air up here backwards, right? And cold air at the ground and it won't be able to mix in. And so you have like this flat area where the pollution is just kind of capped off and it can't mix in. So that's a problem. Are y'all good with that? Um, so here's the words for this. Whee! <laughs> that's a nice color. Um, air temperature, like I said, normally decreases with altitude. Uh, the thermal inversion is going to happen when you have this layer of cool air beneath warm air, so it's upside down. Uh, and then it's going to resist mixing, and so they're going to be um, surrounded by this capped off pollution. Um, so feral, Hadley, and um, polar cells, those are on the test. Do you remember which one's which? Move it on then. Um, here's, here they are in written form if you need to look back at them. Hadley's for hot, remember, feral's for fair weather, and polar's for poles. The Coriolis effect is what you guys saw in class the other day when we, um, I can make this go up, hang on. The, there. Um, the Coriolis effect is the, remember my sheep's name was Coriolis? That's Chase's little name tag. Alright, so the Coriolis effect is the deflection of wind currents from, um, the, the, the path that they would like to take, they get deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and the left in the southern hemisphere. Um, and so they make the wind patterns curved. There's the names of the winds. Um, so next we have some storms, hurricanes and tornadoes. Um, that's fun. 
The only thing I want to talk about this is when we have climate change, uh, you know, climate, um, when it comes warmer, hurricanes are basically fueled by heat, so hurricanes become more intense because they have more fuel, and the fuel is the warm, moist ocean water. Um, so, air pollution, air pollutants, okay. The only thing I want to talk about with this, the word ambient means outside. I'm going to change the color of this highlighter. Keep making that crazy orange color. Um, so, ambient means outside. Um, ambient noise is like surrounding you, right? Like that soft noise that's always around you. I don't know if you've heard that word before. Um, so this is pretty interesting. On the test, though, um, I, I'm going to tell you something about that last picture. But on the test, you have to identify some natural sources of air pollution. Okay, how about forest fires and the volcanoes and um, dust storms and also sea spray? There's your four answers. Got it? Maybe we'll write down that sea spray. Um, so here, this is a neat picture. You guys know that, um, well, here is um, Africa, right? Um, around the equator, a little north of the equator in the Sahara. And so think about that. <laughs> Millions of tons of dust is blown across the Atlantic Ocean every year and deposited in the Brazilian, uh, Amazonian rainforest, okay? And so uh, in the Amazon, uh, a lot, most of the plant nutrients, those are there and life is possible because of the dust storms that bring in dust from the Sahara Desert. Isn't that super interesting? Because think about the trade winds, they blow this way, right? And so the trade winds around the equator, the same ones that we talk about in the Pacific with El Nino, they actually bring in most of the nutrients for the soil for the rainforest. Did you know that was a thing? Neat, right? So, I mean, yes, dust is a natural source of air pollution, but it's also good. Um, fires are bad um, for air pollution uh, and air quality, but, you know, forest fires, we made them worse by uh, suppressing them. And we had talked about fire suppression already. Um, El Nino makes forest fires worse, um, and so you have worse air pollution. There's awful air pollution right now in Indonesia, and we talked about that with uh, El Nino that's going on right now. Uh, aerosols, um, aerosols as far as air pollution goes, they're just fine droplets that can uh, be floating around the atmosphere. The thing about aerosols, when I have like uh, a fire, um, they can actually take the light and reflect it back to space, and so they cool the Earth's surface. And that can cut down actually on uh, the amount of primary productivity. So less photosynthesis. Uh, dust storms, like I said, they are good as far as, you know, the Amazon rainforest, but they can be made, um, they can be made worse by desertification, overgrazing. Um, so, what I want to do is I just want to stop for a second, because I've been talking. Um, I want you guys to get out that primary, oh, it's not primary, um, the criteria air pollutant chart. For um, just like with water pollution, there's point and non-point sources. Same thing, same concept, okay? With point and non-point sources on the air pollution, if it's a smokestack from a power plant, that's a point source. If it's a million cars in a city, that's not a point. So same concept. Uh, primary pollutants, let me explain that to you. A primary air pollutant is like a lemon. Okay, you got, you grow a lemon and you got a lemon and it's a lemon and it's just a lemon. Okay, a secondary air pollutant is like lemonade. You take a lemon and then you squeeze it and you add in some sugar and some water and then you have it at the Chick-fil-A. No, I'm just kidding. But um, that's the secondary air pollutant. So a secondary air pollutant, basically you take a primary air pollutant, that would be your lemon, and you add something in the atmosphere to it. For example, sunlight could be like your sugar, or maybe some oxygen could be like your water. You see what I'm saying? So, a uh, primary pollutant, it's just a pollutant. And something like soot comes out from a fire. Well, it's bad, okay, it's just there. Um, a secondary air pollutant, though, you take a primary air pollutant and then it interacts with something in the atmosphere. And then, um, but it had to be a primary air pollutant first. And if that's not like super clear to you, I'm going to go through these and you'll see what I'm saying. Okay? Um, so there you go. Some examples of that are ozone and sulfuric acid. Ozone is made from taking VOCs and nitrogen dioxide. Those are lemons, primary air pollutants. And then you add in sunlight um, and then you get it, right? So it changed them. But, you know, we're going to go through these. 
Um, so residence time, some air pollutants stay in the air a little longer than others. Um, as far as ours, um, particulate matter, this 10 right here, do you see that? That is uh, 10 microns across. Particulate matter, 2.5 is 2.5 microns across. So that's the difference there. Um, things like carbon dioxide, that's what we're worried about with climate change, methane, um, sulfur hexafluoride, all these things, CFCs, they stay in there for centuries. So um, we're concerned about carbon dioxide because once it's out there, we can't do a whole lot about it quickly. Um, so the Clean Air Act, the Clean Air Act was great. In 1970, it was passed initially, um, and it kind of funded for research and allowed for citizens to sue if um, criteria wasn't met. Um, in 1990, it was strengthened, though. Let me tell you how it was strengthened. Um, auto emissions were tightened up, and so um, if you have an older car, have you ever heard of a catalytic converter? Like, if you have an older car, it doesn't have one. And so the, air, the Clean Air Act of 1990 made that happen, okay? Um, toxic air pollutants. Um, so you can see that all of the criteria air pollutants went down because of this acidic deposition. That was reduced by mostly by the sulfur dioxide trading permit because sulfur dioxide makes for acid rain. Um, and then stratospheric ozone depletion. The Montreal Protocol, when we signed that, we agreed that we would cut down the CFCs. And so the way we, we signed it and then we ratified it, we ratified things by going back to your country and making it happen. The way we did that is we included criteria for CFCs in the Clean Air Act of 1990. The uh, Montreal Protocol was passed in the late 80s. I don't remember exactly the year, but. So, there you go. Whee! Um, the EPA who monitors this. So carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is from, where does it come from? Incomplete combustion. And so that could be from vehicles or burning uh, wood or whatever, but incomplete combustion. Complete combustion makes CO2, carbon dioxide. When we burn fossil fuels, we make carbon dioxide. We have said that about a thousand times this semester. But sometimes it doesn't go through all the way. You get CO instead of CO2. Um, so the reason it's bad is because it binds irreversibly to hemoglobin. I talked about this yesterday. I'm going to tell you again. Hemoglobin is a molecule in your red blood cells. And it's what oxygen hops on to take a ride to your, your brain cell and your muscle cells. All your cells um, get oxygen from your blood. And the hemoglobin is what takes the oxygen from your lungs to your body parts. Now, once carbon monoxide gets attached to hemoglobin, it never comes off. And so those cells that are exposed to carbon monoxide, they are broken until they die. So if you have carbon monoxide exposure, if it's not too bad, you can be uh, given oxygen, like, like on an oxygen mask. But if it's bad enough, the only way you can survive is get a blood transfusion because every blood cell in your body is broken and it can't take in take any oxygen to your body because the, every little hemoglobin has carbon monoxide stuck to it. So that's the issue. Um, Y'all good there? So same thing with animals. Um, so that's the environmental problem. Y'all got that one filled out? Now this is a primary air pollutant. Did I take something and, and did I make another pollutant turn into this? No, it's just there. It's a lemon. Done. Um, uh, here's a picture of a catalytic converter. Um, hit the light slogan. I'm kind of surprised you actually did it because sometimes you don't. Um, <laughs> carbon monoxide goes into the cat. Here's the catalytic converter. See, there's your engine catalytic converter, and there's your exhaust. Anyway, so the carbon monoxide goes into the catalytic converter, and inside a catalytic converter, like people will take catalytic converters and take them to a scrapyard, and because they're three or four hundred dollars, and the reason they're three or four hundred dollars is because they have like silver, platinum, palladium, really expensive metals, and they're in there in a the honeycomb, like a grid, and the carbon monoxide will go through this grid, and it will stick to this metal, and the metal, as it kind of holds on to the carbon monoxide, it will force the carbon monoxide into, uh, with some oxygen, will force it into becoming carbon dioxide. Which, okay, carbon dioxide is still greenhouse gas, but it doesn't kill you. Okay, so that's uh, better. Um, so these little metals act as a catalyst that basically make that reaction going through to carbon dioxide, and um, you get carbon dioxide. And so that's better. And so carbon monoxide emissions, um, I've been reduced by this. If you have a car, 
and it's made in the United States, it has to have a catalytic converter because of the clean air act. Like, that's how all this comes together. And if somebody steals it, you're going to be out of pocket quite a bit. Okay? So there's that, that's what helped um, with that. And if companies weren't forced into doing this by the clean air act, it wouldn't happen. So um, sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide is the rotten egg smell. Sulfur dioxide comes from burning coal. It comes from burning other fossil fuels, but mostly coal um, when we make electricity. And if we use it in industry, like smelting. And uh, this is a primary air pollutant. You take sulfur and coal and you burn it and you get sulfur dioxide. Was there another air pollutant there first that it came from? No. So it's primary. The environmental effects, it can cause acid precipitation. And this has gone down, right? Because of the sulfur emissions permit trade. You got that chart? I see how some of y'all filling it out. Now, the two most abundant gases in the atmosphere are nitrogen and oxygen. 78% uh, of the atmosphere is nitrogen, and 21% is oxygen. So, nitrogen oxides, they come from the simple act of burning anything. Heat in the atmosphere takes the nitrogen in the atmosphere and the oxygen in the atmosphere, and it binds them together. It fuses them together. So, no magic chemical makes nitrogen dioxide. It's just heat. Heat will force nitrogen and oxygen together chemically. So, anyway, anything that you have heat from, vehicles, um, engine combustion, uh, internal, uh, industrial combustion, any of those. And so, what um, nitrogen dioxide does, it also causes acid precipitation, but it causes smog too. So, this is a big player in, in, in um, photochemical smog, actually. Yes? The health effects, this is a respiratory irritant, especially to the young, old people with asthma. That's the answer to everything. If you have an air pollutant and you don't know what the answer is, it's a respiratory irritant, especially to people with uh, asthma. Excuse me, let me back up. People that are young, old, and people with asthma, right? So, all right, um, so volatile organic compounds. VOCs, these are basically any carbon containing chemical, usually derived from oil, and they can be used um, and emitted by engines. Uh, they can be in paints and solvents. Um, a lot of times they're in preservatives for furniture and stuff. This is like your new car smell. I talked about this a little bit. They can react to produce secondary air pollutants. And so the secondary air pollutants that we have talked about, um, we'll get to those in a second with ozone. Um, but they're car uh, carcinogens, so like benzene and What's the other one? Um, always formaldehyde. They're both VOCs and they both cause cancer. There's lots of VOCs that cause cancer, but knowing two of them is good enough, okay? So, PM or particulate matter. Um, oh, volatile organic compounds. Do they come from something else that was already air pollutant? So, they're, they're primary. Um, particulate matter, or these are just suspended solids or liquid particles. Um, they can be both. So, so, let me go over this as you're looking. Primary air pollutants that are particulate matter include dust and soot. You burn something and you get soot. You have a dust storm, you have dust. That's primary air pollutant. Secondary air pollutants, do you remember sulfur dioxide? Do you remember sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide? So if you add a little bit more oxygen from the atmosphere, then you get nitrates and sulfates. So, See, I took a lemon and I added some a sugar and some water, right? So, in this case, I took nitrate and, not nitrate, excuse me, I took nitrogen dioxide um, and I took sulfur dioxide and I added a little more oxygen to it and you get nitrates and uh, sulfates. So, nitrates, sulfates, dust and soot, they're all respiratory irritants, especially the young, old people with asthma. Um, there are two size classes and I had to talk about this a second ago. How you doing? What's the uh, for particulate matter, um, so they, these guys can reduce photosynthesis. Dust and soot can reduce photosynthesis. Nitrates and sulfates go into making acid rain. So, yes, ma'am. What would be the environmental uh, VOCs go into helping make smog. Anybody else? All right. Um, so lead, lead was a heavy metal. The thing about lead is it, um, 
we it, it bioaccumulates like mercury. And so lead and mercury, they're both neurotoxins. And when I say neurotoxins, they damage your nervous system. And neurotoxins, they cause seizures at high doses. They can cause death. But like if you have to give a health effect of a heavy metal like lead or mercury, go with lowered IQ or learning disabilities. I feel like that's the easiest thing to remember about a, about a neurotoxin. So you have to say something to go with that. Um, it's banned in develop, uh, developed countries, um, but it was used in gasoline. If you look, it's been 99% reduced because the biggest contributor by far was leaded gasoline. So it made your car run really smooth, but it made your kids really dumb. Not, I mean, you know, I don't know, but it was in, you know, paint. Every time I take my kids to the um, pediatrician, I have to sign like this paper that says I don't have lead paint because kids eat lead paint chips, apparently. Um, anyway, so the biggest reductions, oops, well, okay, I was going to highlight there. The biggest reductions have been because of things like catalytic converters, but also scrubbers. And scrubbers are just things that you can put on um, uh, smokestacks to remove uh, pollutants before they leave. So I have a picture of a scrubber. This is a wet scrubber, and so what wet scrubbers do? There's like three kinds of scrubbers. I'll tell you the other two, and I'll go over them real good on uh, May 2nd, okay? I'm serious about that, like I'm not playing. But um, a wet scrubber just takes uh, smoke exhaust, and it has dust and soot particles in it, and so it'll spray it with a fine mist, and then any kind of solid particle will settle out and uh, be captured and then the smoke exhaust is uh, less sooty and less dusty and um, so then it's uh, not ha it doesn't have as many particulate matter uh, pieces in it. There's also electrostatic ones where you can take the particles and charge them and stick them to another charged surface and yeah okay well, we'll talk about it May, May 2nd, May 1st. Um, let's see, leaded gas has gone down. Um, nitrogen dioxide um, when we see smog, like in the picture that I showed you on the way in the door today, or at the beginning, excuse me, of the PowerPoint today, um, nitrogen dioxide is the red, foulish smelling air pollutant that makes uh, smog kind of hazy, okay? It's this. Um, and it, uh, so it makes acid rain, but it also is a contributor to smog. Um, so it's part of the group nitrogen oxides. So. Um, so ozone, this is one of the ones on your paper, yeah? So tropospheric ozone. Everybody take your fingers and do this. Thumbs up. So ozone up in the stratosphere is good. Up in the stratosphere. Two thumbs up is good. Thank you. So thumbs up if the ozone is in the stratosphere. If the ozone is in the troposphere down at the ground, that's bad. Like thumbs down. See? So, yeah, okay, um, so the thing about ozone, the ozone in the stratosphere is there naturally, it's in this natural equilibrium between oxygen and ozone, blocks the ultraviolet radiation, that's great. Stra stratospheric ozone is, is what we like, okay. Tropospheric ozone is what we make through smog, and it's bad. It's not ever good. There's no good things from that. Um, so, ozone is actually a respiratory irritant. Especially to the young golden people with asthma. And um, what ends up happening, I have a nice picture that explains how this happens, but it results from water, sugar, and lemons. You see that? You see water, sugar, and lemons? Um, so sunlight and heat, okay, so those are environmental things in the atmosphere. And then you take two primary air pollutants, nitrogen oxides and VOCs, and you turn them into ozone. And I have a nice picture that shows how that works in a second. So it makes it a secondary air pollutant. It's a component of smog. It can arm your respiratory tract. It's respiratory irritant, especially to the young old people with asthma. Um, sorry, I just have like 10. There's like, seriously, like five or six lines like that. Like, if you know, big, you just kill the FRQs on the real AP exam. And I've, I've said them all already. But um, anyway. And so if we look at all these criteria air pollutants, they've all gone down. Um, some have gone down more than others. Um, so there are some um, air quality things that haven't really been monitored enough, like factory farms, uh, feedlots, those things um, they could probably do better with. So industry is, in industrial country, industries and transportation is our 
issues. And developing countries, they have different problems. We're going to get to that in a second. Um, oh, we don't still don't have any CO2 things, right? We have no laws on that. Yesterday, the Senate, they went to, they finally, like for years, they've been um, trying to get um, a bill through Senate uh, to reduce CO2 emissions. And yesterday, it went to the Senate to get signed and voted on and it got voted down. Yeah. So, um, way to go, us. Um, so, here's the thing. Um, I'm still going there. So, Asia has that Asian brown cloud. We had to kind of talk about that a little bit already. That kills uh, one or... Whoa. Nope. Sorry. You want to learn about buffering? Whatever. Um, yeah, so... Um, it kills one or two million people every year. Um, this is a normal scene in China for children to have to wear um, a protected mask because the uh, particulate levels on the atmosphere are very high. Um, and so it kind of, that's really sad, but that's very normal. There are uh, parts of Asia where they don't see the sun for a couple months. It's very, very common. I have a friend that he's, he's a chemist, that actually, and he works for Apple. And um, he doesn't work in the lab anymore. Like, he's now in management. And he went to uh, China for a couple weeks, and he said he didn't see the sun a single time. And it wasn't because of the weather. It was because of the smog. So, yeah. Um, anyway, so that's what I was talking about, the Asian brown cloud. Uh, Two-mile thick layer of pollution over southern Asia. And that, of course, is going to increase crop, nope, decrease crop production, right? Because you're walking out the sun. Um, it's going to increase flooding. Let me tell you why that is. That doesn't make sense, right? When you make a cloud, when you make a water droplet in a cloud, it needs a condensation nuclei. Condensation is where it turns into liquid. And a nuclei it needs a speck of dust in the middle. And so all these soot particles act as, um, like, basically an area for clouds to form. All right, two different kinds of smog. This is industrial smog. Your next slide says industrial smog. So maybe you draw an arrow to this picture. Let me show you how this goes. So industrial smog, you take coal and oil. So this is like old school London, Pennsylvania smog before, um, you know, we really had problems with cities and driving. This is something, I mean, London had problems with smog for centuries, right? So, um, in moist environments, cold environments, it's industrial smog that gives you problems. So, anyway, you burn coal. It has sulfur in it. The sulfur makes sulfur dioxide with oxygen. I've already talked about this today, but there's a picture. And then you'll get sulfuric acid. And so you have a little bit of acid rain, and you'll have some acid particles in the air. You also end up getting soot and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. That's industrial smog. Pretty simple. You get sulfur dioxide, you get carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and you get some ash particles. And so this is a smog event in 1948. So that was before, you know, um, driving was a big thing. This is more from industry and coal burning for heat. So there's your last picture. Sorry. I don't know how this isn't broken. In memento. Oh. Um, the next slide talks about here. Industrial smog. And like I said, it's just from burning coal and oil. And there's the stuff that you make. Carbon monoxide and soot. And then sulfuric acid and you get acid rain. So highlight that if you need to. Um, this one's a little bit more complicated. There's three questions on the test about this. Let me break it down for you right now. Photochemical smog. Photo. What does photo mean? Light. light. And so when we're talking about outside, what do you reckon kind of light we're going to be talking about? Like maybe from the big circle in the sky. Yeah, so, I mean, you're right about a city, but as far as, like, making smog on a large scale, the photo, as far as this goes, is going to be the sun. And do you remember the picture I drew at the beginning of the class of the mountains and the sun coming up? That's where this is going to be coming into play, okay? Um, so, anyway, so photo coming from the sun, and then chemical, the chemical part of photochemical smog, so it's photochemical smog, that's the word I'm going with. The chemical part is the NO2. From the heat of combustion, you take, you make this from just burning stuff, and VOCs, 
and VOCs, um, when we're talking about air pollution in cities where people are driving, the VOCs are mostly from gasoline. Gasoline is a volatile organic compound. When you go pump gas and you smell it, it's volatizing. And it's organic because it's made out of like dead stuff buried in the ocean, right? Uh, made out of carbon. So anyway, uh, let's go through the chemical parts. Party time. Okay, so let's take it from the top. I have a car. The heat of combustion takes the nitrogen in the air and the oxygen in the air and makes nitrogen dioxide. You good so far? We're going to go over here. That nitrogen dioxide, if it is struck with ultraviolet radiation, do you know how yesterday we talked about CFCs and how the ultraviolet radiation can pop off one of the chlorines? Well, ultraviolet radiation can also pop off one of the oxygens from NO2. All right, so I'm going to have that. Yes, ma'am? Are you recording? That I never started again. I think I started it. I don't think I am. Aww. We'll see. So I'm doing some serious teaching. Oh, well, it's going. All the things. Yes, people at home, I'm sorry. I'm teaching. Um, how do I get back to where I was? I feel like if I hit this button. Okay, good. Um, so, backtrack. Um, I have nitrogen in the air and oxygen in the air, and I make NO2. If I hit that with ultraviolet radiation, one of the oxygens will get popped off. See? NO, and then a single O. Well, I don't know if y'all know this, but oxygen is one of the seven diatomic elements. That means it has to be bonded with something else. So that single oxygen, that's not going to work out. Um, so that single oxygen, if I take a 1O, and then I have O2 in the air, 1O plus 2Os makes 3Os. That's where your ozone's coming from, at the ground. That's a respiratory irritant. And when I say it's a part of smog, that's why it's a part of smog. And this usually happens in the presence of VOCs. Okay, so um, usually VOCs are in the soul party. All right. Um, the other part of this little nice uh, chemical craziness is I take NO2, and if I add in water, um, you end up getting nitric acid, and that's going to cause acid rain. So um, we've done a great job as far as reducing sulfur dioxide emissions because we have emissions trading permits, but we don't have emissions trading permits from heat from combustion. See how you can't really make an engine be less hot? That's hard to do. So nitrogen dioxide, nitrogen oxides are the least reduced of all the criteria air pollutants because they're made from heat. Okay. Um, and so this part, we don't really need to know about the pans. You don't need to know about that. So photochemical smog, it needs sun. And so if I go back to this picture, that's a crazy looking picture. Um, all of these things, the nitrogen dioxide and the VOC, they're all hanging around down here waiting for the sun to come up. And then the ultraviolet radiation is going to come down here and start that process. And so smog levels tend to peak by mid-afternoon, 3, 4 o'clock, because you had all this stuff in the morning commute, sitting there waiting for the sun to come up, and the sun's out, and all these photochemical reactions are occurring in the city. Um, so they say, like, if you want to, like, if you're, I don't know if you ever watch the news, but if you're, like, older or you're a kid or whatever, you want to go running, they say to do it early in the morning, right, because of this. And if you go in the afternoon, you're more prone to be um, subjected to uh, higher levels of ozone in the air. So there's all that. You good? That's, it's kind of complicated looking, but it's not that bad. Um, so here's photochemical smog. Here's all the things I just said. You may want to highlight that. And like I said, to the photochemical smog, the ozone, and the NO2, the respiratory irritants, especially the people, young old people that ask me. Um, this looks really familiar. Seemed like I explained this yesterday. Um, refrigerants, right? And um, propel cans and uh, air conditioners, they contain CFCs like Freon, if you have to give an example. Um, they're hit with ultraviolet radiation, chlorine. Quad chlorine is mad because he's separated from his family, so he goes and um, attacks the ozone triplets that keep us safe from ultraviolet radiation. He steals an oxygen, and that leaves an O2 right there. Um, and then in all reality, like I was saying yesterday, some of y'all asked, this is actually another chlorine monoxide and so those oxygens go together, these oxygens go together, and then this chlorine 
goes back that way. And this can be repeated hundreds of thousands of times. So this is how the stratosphere ozone is depleted. Um, and so these things, um, like I said yesterday, um, ultraviolet radiation can cause um, cataracts, it can cause skin cancer, um, and so there's that. Um, CFCs are the group of chemicals that are typically um, blamed for that. And like I said, the refrigerants, uh, it's a big part of it, and I um, told you that the Montreal uh, protocols for this, and you can remember that because Montreal's cold and this was in refrigerants. Um, we replaced these with HCFCs, um, but, you know, we'll get to that in a second. Um, one chlorine can destroy 100,000 ozone molecules. Um, and so the reason the ozone hole is over the Antarctic, I don't know if you know that, but it's in the southern hemisphere. There's a, a vortex of moving air in the stratosphere, and it kind of circulates all the CFCs and all of the other air pollutants, too, over the south pole. And so that's where the hole is largest. Um, people in the southern hemisphere, um, South America and Australia, they have to wear lots of sunscreen all year or they will get sunburned. It's a, a skin cancer rates are much higher there because of this. We don't really feel those effects because we're not down there, but they are and they can tell. So um, anyway, that's what the ozone hole is. Um, like I said, there's a this vortex um, that sends it on down there. The Montre Montreal Protocol, that was the agreement to cut them. Still challenges with this um, because um, the this, this CFCs from decades ago are just now getting broken down, some of them. Um, it did do a good job. As, oops. It did do a pretty good job as far as um, reducing the emissions. Um, so da -da -da. it can serve as a model. It was a really good. Um, success story for international agreements. Um, so acid rain and acid deposition. Acid deposition um, is the deposition of any acidic particle. And so when we talk about acid rain, it can also be like acid snow, acid sleet, acid whatever. So it doesn't have to be rain, right? Um, and so if we look at how acid rain is made, we already kind of talked about this, but let's look at it. If we burn coal, these are primary pollutants. Sulfur dioxide is from burning coal. I just the sulfur in the uh, uh, coal reacts with oxygen and gets sulfur dioxide. Nitric oxide is heat of combustion. Those are my lemons. If I add in water and oxygen, then I get sulfuric acid. That's a secondary pollutant. And I get nitric acid. So um, this has really gone down. Sulfuric acid has gone down a lot because we have the emissions trading permits. Nitric acid has gone down less. So if I look at some pictures of the United States, um, it can damage vegetation. It can also damage things made out of marble and limestone. Um, I have a picture of a map of the United States, but I'm going to talk about this first because I'm going to forget. Um, so why is this bad for uh, the environment or whatever? You want? Why is this bad for the environment? Um, the thing about acid deposition is it causes nutrients to be uh, soluble and get leached out of the top soil. And we had talked about this with high pH and soil when we talk about soil, but I'm talking about it again. So um, that's the issue. Um, it can also cause the pH of water bodies to be too low and be out of the range of tolerance for aquatic organisms. They can die and cause um, loss of biodiversity. So that's one of those that says this here. Yep. Um, and then if you have any structures that are made out of, um, you know, marble or limestone, that's going to be a problem. All right, so if you look at this picture, the top picture is in 1990. And if you look at the average pH on the East Coast, you had 4.1. Um, normal rain, this is on the AP exam. They're going to try to trick you this. Uh, nor normal rain is around 5.6 or 5.7. So normal rain is acidic because of the carbonic acid thing. Remember that? Um, but before 1990 and the improvements in the Clean Air Act, I mean, the whole East Coast over here, you were in the low fours for the pH. And that was a byproduct of coal emissions from power plants and also from industry. But when the, the sulfur dioxide uh, criteria was put out there, uh, people came up with scrubbers for uh, sulfur dioxide. And so they actually have these calcium scrubbers in power plants, and it ends up making calcium sulfate, which is gypsum. Like they, and that's what's in, like, sheetrock. So they make sheetrock 
pieces, like particles, basically at the power plant, and they sell it to make sheetrock. And so that's part of the scrubber process. Pretty interesting. So it's a chemical scrubber. It takes calcium and sulfate, and you end up making a mineral, which is nice. Um, anyway, you can tell that the pH has come up. Um, so now it, it, within a better range of tolerance for most aquatic things. Um, indoor air quality. Um, so you need to know what the biggest issues for indoor air quality are in the developing countries versus the developed countries. Um, the thing about us in the developed world is we have been trying to make our houses so energy efficient that we have sealed them off and weatherized them so well that we have higher concentrations of indoor air pollutants now. And then people spend so much time indoors. In a developing country, this is a big deal, um, they are going to take wood and dung and crop residues and that's how they're going to cook their food because they don't have any fossil fuels like natural grass or whatever like we do. And so what ends up happening, um, they do this inside their homes with inadequate ventilation and a lot of times the wood isn't cured. We talked about cured wood yesterday with it being dried, right? And so they're going to have problems with too much soot. Um, and they're also going to have problems with carbon monoxide and they're going to be in this little hut and they're going to be subjected to this indoor air pollution. So fuel burning in developing countries um, is 7% uh, of the deaths in the developing world is because of this. Um, so what ends up happening, they um, have this indoor air pollution from this fuel wood and fuel wood is not a special kind of tree that you can run a car on. I actually saw that one time that happened. Um, fuel wood is wood that you burn like firewood, okay? Um, but it produces soot, carbon monoxide, all the stuff, um, and these people that are cooking in their house, they're subjected to it. Um, in the developed world, in the places like we live, um, the biggest problem with indoor air pollution is cigarettes. Cigarettes. Secondhand smoke is also a problem. Obviously, it causes lung cancer. Okay. And it's a respiratory irritant, especially for the young old and people with asthma. Um, so, radon. Radon causes 21,000 deaths a year in the United States. And what radon causes that makes people die is it causes lung cancer. And so, radon comes from the radioactive decay of uranium in bedrock, right? And so what ends up happening is this radon gas will seep up through your basement. You don't really know about it unless you have a radon detector. Um, and you see, if you look at this map of Georgia, we don't really have a whole lot of problems, but out west it's an issue. And so they can actually um, sort of build houses in a way that will keep radon gas out if you know it's a problem in the area. VOCs are an issue. VOCs are like benzene and formaldehyde. They're in uh, gasoline, they're in paint, they're in preservatives and furniture, uh, any kind of varnish. So uh, VOCs are uh, very diverse. Many are um, carcinogens like formaldehyde. There's formaldehyde. Um, and if you get a VOC you never heard of, it's a respiratory irritant, especially the young old people with asthma. Um, so anyway. Uh, as far as other indoor air pollutants, some of them are actually alive, like uh, fungi, mold, spores, all that. My sister actually died of a, um, a, a, a asthma attack because she had mold in her house. She had her toilet overflowed um, in her kid's bathroom, and it got in her basement, and she never fixed her basement. She had mold in her basement, and she had asthma, and she died of the asthma attack. So this is like a real thing. So um, I only told her, and she didn't listen. It was so sad. Um, Whatever. So anyway, that's that's a problem. And developing countries, um, they need to dry their wood if they can have um, better stoves if possible. And developed countries, limit your exposure to known toxicants. Yeah, you did it. Okay, so go through this. I'm gonna go through this real quick so I can get you guys paired up with your people and your groups. Uh, the major component of the atmosphere in the Earth is nitrogen. So nitrogen with convective circulation, what ends up happening is you have less dense, warmer air rises, so C. Ozone in the blank is a pollutant, so uh, down low is bad, right, thumbs down. So troposphere is um, a pollutant, and then stratosphere is vital for life, so B. Um, if you're selling on a ship, you're going to use the trade winds, so B. Clean air, oops. 
Clean Air Act does all the following, except it doesn't forbid emissions trading. It, it encourages it for sulfur dioxide. So A is wrong, so it makes it right. Ha, ha, ha. Um, which criteria for pollutant is highly reactive, blah, blah, blah. That's uh, nitrogen dioxide, so B. Uh, the Montreal Protocol is our greatest environmental success story because it successfully um, slowed down ozone depletion. I don't, it didn't stop it, right? So that's probably not correct, but I mean C is the answer. Uh, the stratosphere contains the most ozone, so A, and it does it increases in temperature. So you do need to know that for the for for the test. But um, the conclusion from this graph. The thing that has been least reduced is NOx, so nitrous oxides, so B. And like I told you, the reason that makes it really hard to do is because it's from heat. So let me stop this. Um, there are 24 people in this room. And what you're going to be doing for me is you're going to be working in pairs on a project. So while I get myself situated and...